Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Let's just say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. New book today, Haggai. Haggai uh, means in the Hebrew tongue, feast or festival. And this is the first proof that God spoke through prophets after the return. The return from what? Babylon. So here we have something that is, it's, Haggai was an elderly man. God used him anyway. And um, uh, this old prophet God used because incidentally when they got back they laid the foundation of the temple all well enough, but then began building their own homes and really made them fancy and ignored the temple. You can imagine our father was very unhappy as you will see even in this first chapter. Now, prophetically, what does this have to do? Well, number one, you're gonna find that there are prophecies especially pertaining to the end times. And it has to do with the building of a temple, all right, that is not necessarily made with hands, but it is the many-membered body, the many-membered temple, not a house, not a building. That is to say, gathering God's children back in His Word, in His um, uh, eternal Word, interested in it, changing lives. That's the temple, those followers of the living God rather than those that would be deceived. Basically, that's what this has to do with and with that having been said, I think you're going to see that it is feast and festival time when you absorb the entirety of this book, Haggai. Chapter 1, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet from Zerubbabel, never, always remember the meaning of that word. It means born in Babel. A lot of us were born in Babel, and then you came out of Babel, meaning confusion, into truth. So let it be symbolic, if you would, of a generation born in Babel, but woke up, all right? The son of Shealtiel, that means ask for of Yah, uh, or of God, rather. Uh, governor of Judah, and Joshua, and of course Joshua means salvation or savior, and translated to English is Jesus, okay? Only Joshua, the son of Josedek, um, uh, he who is just, the high priest saying. Now, first I want you to grasp here that we have the governor, meaning we have the political, we have the high priest, uh, so we have both the political and the religious uh, leaders as well as the one God would choose, uh, Zerubbabel, who would actually take a great part in building this temple. But the old man Haggai is the one that ordered it because of driving the people with the word of God, letting the word of God accomplish the deed. Observe, verse two. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, the time is not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. It, it just isn't time yet. We have the foundation laid, but we must build our own houses. And what kind of houses were they building for themselves? Verse three. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, for is it time for you, O ye that to dwell in your sealed houses? That means paneled, fancy, and this house lie waste? I mean, you're, here you have time to not only just lay up a shelter, but to panel it with fine cedar wood and make it exceptionally fancy, but no, you don't have time for my house. Now, many people think of this, if you would, as we're laying foundation to the many-membered body. How many people in the world today are a little too busy with their own house, probably excessive payments on it and so forth, to really pay that much attention to our Father? 
Now, just think about it. I want you to reason these things out as we go along. God seems to be saying here, you got time for yourself, but you don't seem to have any time for me. Do you think God lets people get away with that? Mm -mm. No way. Verse 5. Not then, nor will he today. Verse 5. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now, I, I, want you to, I want you to absorb this word consider. It means uh, you let it settle down into your brain, right to the very trunk of it. And you think. Now, this will be utilized five times. That's grace in, in this book. And, and it means exactly that. You stop. You meditate. And you think on what has been said and what I'm about to say. You better analyze yourself, your house, and God's house. And that is to say, what you're doing and what you're doing for God. It's just that simple. Okay, verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Now, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. God can either put holes in your bag or your bucket, or he can seal them. That's just the way it is. Um, I, I believe that with all my heart and mind because it's really quite simple because if a person does not have God's blessings, they're never going to have peace of mind. I don't care how successful you are, how much you plant, how much you reap. If you are void of, com of um, peace of mind, then you're never going to be happy. There might be little spurts of excitement along in life, but you will never be happy and content if you do not have the blessings of God and the love of your true Father and returning that love to Him which bonds the um, relationship between father and child. I'm talking about the eternal Father and you, His child. I'm talking about you. And until that bond is made, you're never going to have peace of mind. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many acres you've sown, you're not going to find peace of mind or have enough or be satisfied until you find peace of mind. And that comes from our Father. He does have a way of putting bags, holes rather, in your bag. In other words, let's say that, um, let's say that through nature, well, we'll, we'll, as much as we're in the farming community, we'll, we'll use a farming community. Every farm has a well. They do not have a, a, a city water system. They have to have their own water system. So they drill a well and they put, usually if it's a deep well, a submergible pump in it. Well, God kind of controls nature to a degree. And let's say that, uh, what if lightning hits that pump? You're going to have to replace the pump. And many people will pay one way or the other insurance to let their little old bag of holes go or they're going to replace the pump, period. And though they accomplish quite a bit, their little things just seem to flow in bundles for them until there's holes in their bank account. It just, you might say it just slips through their fingers. All right? And so it does. Now, always consider this, though. Let's say the old boy that sells pumps. Let's say that he's a servant of God and God is happy with him. When God strikes that pump with lightning, he's going to do good. God, he's going to be blessed. He's going to sell a pump. Get to bring out a nice big rig and pull that rascal. Insert the new pump. He does all right. So blessings can be controlled. I believe that with all my heart and mind uh, and soul. That God can bless or he can take away. It's, it's however um, uh, he chooses. 
and he will never give you more than you're capable of taking care of. That's what he thinks about your ability. Uh, of course, life is a progress into growing closer to your father. And when you grow very close, you might find out that it doesn't take so very much to happy you or to give you peace of mind as long as it's yours, you know? It doesn't... Um, and uh, you know how to take care of it and you know how to keep it, all right? Verse 7, we'll continue. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There it goes again. Stop and think. Let this settle. You think it over, what was just said, and compare yourself to it and think about it. What, it might say, what have, what have you planted or sown for God lately? Now, you rarely ever hear me talk about uh, tithe or something like that. Does it enter into this? Of course it does. And um, when God, I would be a poor teacher if I did not bring that into play. Uh, I'm not a beggar, and uh, God blesses this ministry quite well. That's why you never see us do telethons or beg you or anything like that, because God takes care of us. Why? Because we teach God's Word. So that's, that's your problem, okay? It's all on your shoulders, that count is. But what he's saying here is, remember my house also, all right? That's what he's saying. Think about it. And that being the subject of this book, verse 8. Go up to the mountain, that's to say the hill country, and bring wood and build the house, the temple. And I will take pleasure in it. It will make me happy. God's telling you here what he wants what it will take to please him. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, uh, what was the temple like in the first temple, let's say? Oh, it was fancy. I'm not talking about the tent, the tabernacle. I'm talking about the one Solomon built. I mean, it was fantastic. It was beautiful marble, you know, and granite and just, it was a fabulous place. He said, go up here and saw some logs and bring it down and build it and I will be glorified. I'll take great pride in it. Meaning, it isn't the value necessarily of the uh, material. It's doing the work for the Father, planting seeds, whatever it might be that you do that God has gifted you in. And some of you might say, well, he's, oh, I don't know what my gift is. Well, hey, stick around. It won't be long because it's going to be time for God's elect to witness against the false Messiah. And really, that's our prime purpose for being, uh, necessarily, is to witness whereby all can hear the truth. Now, there is something in this verse that the layperson is rarely ever going to hear about. The word utilized here as glorified is ekabda, ekabda in the Hebrew tongue. It is minus a he on the end. In other words, it is minus an h is what we would say in English. It's just not there. There is a note in the Masara concerning this very thing. And the uh, well, many scholars and men have said, well, it, being says H means five. It must mean that five things are missing from this temple. Let's see, what would they be? They said, well, it would be the ark and uh, the precious altar fire. And, you know, you were never to con flame the altar with uh, strange fire. You know, two died for that. And there would be the Thurman and the Yerman Thurman. The, uh, and um, then would come um, the Shekinah would be missing in this building, as well as the uh, spirit of prophecy. Well, uh, a man is wrong there because this building is full of the spirit of prophecy through this one Haggai. So that, that just kind of really knocks them out of the saddle, does it not? All for naught. Well, I'm going to tell you what the he, the H, which is five, is. Five is grace. Why will God be pleased with it? 
because it will be from that same hill country that timber will be cut that will be make the cross that his only begotten son will be nailed to spiked through hand and feet the true Yeshua that will bring forth grace to the children and that's what five means therefore the minus of hay for the in-depth scholar to know and to understand that our father is in control always in control that being the true meaning I know you probably never heard that taught before but disregard what some man might say and stick to the facts of God's word then you will never go wrong therefore ekabda minus he means the grace I will be glorified why because he's he's glorified to the point that he brings forth grace unmerited favor for those that will believe upon his son which is the head of that church that temple regardless of what material it's made from that will bring eternal life to that many membered body and uh, thus the hill country turns out to be a wonderful beautiful place and our father takes much pleasure in your letting him know that you accept that son that you accept that cross that you accept that building, the many-membered uh, body. Your companion Bibles will have footnotes relating to the Hebrew manuscripts in regard to this, the Masara, and, um, but it will not tell you the, mean, the true meaning. It will tell you what men say. I tell you what God says in He. Because it was from this deed that grace came forth and there's nothing else that it could be to the Christian. This is why you want to be careful in studying um, teachers who work from um, the manuscripts if they be not Christian. Because, as a matter of fact, there's a very blasphemous teaching that Christ had children because people do not know what the word betrothal means to a Christian in the religious sense. They do not know the value of the word betrothal from the mouth of Christ in his teachings. And they take it literal. So you want to be careful. A word to the wise is sufficient. Verse 9, ye looked for much you had big plans, didn't you? Expected a lot, and lo, it, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow up on it. Why? Question. Boy, hey, this is good stuff. Listen. Why, God asked, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man in unto his own house. I don't know. You want to be real careful. And, and does God expect you to take care of your own house? Of course he does. That's, that's expected. You, that is part of your duty is to be uh, fruitful and to be successful. That's a good mark and a good sign of a good Christian is to be very successful and blessed. You know he's doing something right as long as it is the blessings from God and not blessings from ripping people off, okay? God doesn't expect Christians to be paupers. He expects you to take care of your own house. But at the same time, a wise person that is able to be successful within their own should also be a part of God's house. In other words, should have room for the Father from whom all blessings flow. Now, to um, God says, I can blow up on it. I, I want you to, he said, I, I can blow it away. You can bring it home and gather it up and whoosh, it's gone. Hey, but do you know what he can do at the same time? That same puff. Whoosh, whoosh. Have you ever seen anybody start a fire? 
in, in, uh, at the altar or in a furnace, a fireplace, when you get the sparks on the little tender uh, starting material and you blow up on it to make it jump to flame and be successful, he can blow on it. It can go one way or the other. Okay? It can start a real fire in your life. By that I mean you can become a ball of fire, figure of speech, and, and be a can-do type individual. Or he can take what you've got and just blow it to dust. Blow it to thunder. All right? I don't know. It's, it's up to you. It's considerate, my friend. This is very serious. And if I were to say anywhere in God's Word... The, um, the recipe for success is written in this chapter. Because all success, true success, that that brings you peace of mind, comes from your Father, your Heavenly Father, your Holy Father. And you either please Him or you tick Him off one or the other in your life. Uh, he'll turn His back on you. It doesn't bother Him uh, when I use the terminology tick off, probably that's the wrong thing to say, but it gets, it communicates with a certain group of people that I'm trying to communicate right now. And then you know that Father is unhappy with you. A lot of people say, I just don't know why things just go wrong in my life. Well, grow up. Be somebody. Be honest with yourself and with your Father. Always please your father, and basically that should please you. And don't worry about who else it pleases, all right? Because if they're A-OK -okay people, it's going to please them OK. It pleased them a bunch, all right? But, but you weren't set out to be, as a child of God, a man pleaser. He didn't intend that we be pleasing to, to the devil, all right? We're, we're his enemy. We do our father's work, and naturally, it rankles his hide. But tough on him. Who cares? Please your father, and be pleased that you please him. And those that are supposed to will be pleased with you, all right? Take care of your father's house also, if you ever expect to have anything. And, you know, many might say, well, why would that word H, hey, come into that eighth verse because of grace we all fall short we all mess up and he added that in so that you would know that if you love him love will cover over such a vast amount of sin on repentance of our ability to to succeed on our own without falling short and saying father I'm sorry I'll try again. Just don't be a quitter. God doesn't like quitters, okay? He just really doesn't. It's, do you know why? Even with all his help and blessings, if somebody is a quitter, he, he just can't uh, make them successful. Because every time they get started, they quit. He can put more carrots and dangle more pr uh, prosperous projects in front of them and when they quit, he can't help them. So don't ever be a quitter. God doesn't abide quitters. How are you, do you wish to be successful? Always continue and you're going to complete the project. Good, bad, or ugly. There's one thing you will know. You did your part. And if God's pleased with, uh, the, that with what you do, you will be blessed. That's his guarantee. So take care of your own house. But probably the most important thing to you is God's house. I'm not talking about buildings here. I hope you understand that. This is who has the fanciest building. That's why he used timber in the uh, verse 8. It wasn't, he wasn't too good to uh, be proud of something any more than would be made of the substance of the cross that his son hung on. I'll be pleased with it if you just get out there and try. Do it. But he inserted that grace for our shortcomings. Yep, we all fall short, but don't be a quitter. Okay? Don't be a poor me baby. Keep going. Do it his way. Verse 10. 
Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew. And when you, when you disregard God, I mean, you know, dew means blessings. Let it symbolize blessings. It stopped. And the earth is stayed from her fruit. It doesn't matter what you do. This is what I do. I'm going to hold back your progress. I'm going to hold back the rain. I'm going to make you stump your toe. I'm going to make you fall flat on your face. Why? You don't care about my house. You don't care about me. And I own all that stuff you're playing with. And he does. He owns everything. All you do is play with it or borrow it for a little while. Well, I'll have you know I have the title and deed to my property that's all paid for. Uh-huh. And when you die, where does it go, son? It belongs to your father. He lets you use it a while. Verse 10. Therefore, I'm sorry, we got that. What it's saying is, hey, there's a lot of things I control. That's what you better consider. God controls a lot of things, and he can hold back any part of it he so chooses on you. Verse 11. And I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. In other words, I can ruin everything you try to do if I so choose. You know, there is one thing about it. This is not a digression. Some might consider it so. But do you know all he has to do to, to make a tremendous drought and to upset everybody's apple cart is in the long stretch of the Pacific. And we've come to learn this more so than ever through El Nino that we have at this time, the little child or the Christ child, it's called. In 1600, uh, the year of our Lord, by Spanish sailors, they noticed it, that the water doesn't boil from below to above, and it gets real hot on the surface when you don't have enough wind or, or currents to stir or mix the water. And when the water gets hot, then you've got floods and much rain and many people were thankful of that this year because they didn't have a heat bill to speak of up north and down in the south we got soaked and further south they got just burned out drought look at australia now all you got to do is bring a, a a low nino in and it's just the opposite it gets the other part okay you know god doesn't have to do that much or cause that much to happen to cause a lot of uncomfort in weather speaking. I'm just saying that to show you how easily he can accomplish it. He's got a lot of power and a lot of control. It's best you have him happy with you. You know, God sees to it that most people have at least a guardian, whether it be their own mother and father, blood, or, or um, a guardian that as they grow up in childhood, they are supposed to be disciplined where they learn you need to please he who is over thee, okay? If you want any contentment, better to please he or she that is over thee, all right? Well, so in life, that's one of the first lessons a person should learn is keep father happy. It's not that hard to keep him happy. Pretty soon, real wisdom is to know that beginning to love him is the very beginning of knowledge. That's scriptural. So you set your own course and you steer your own course in life and you bring things down upon your own head or build yourself up from beneath to a place fitting a Christian. I don't know. How are you doing? I'd say check your fruit out. How are you doing? And I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm not trying to put anyone on a spot. I'm saying consider. Think about it. That's what he told you to do. How are you doing? Doing fine? Hey, okay. God loves you then. But when he blows on your stuff, what's it going to be? To blow it away or to kindle it into something wonderful? It's kind of up to you, not him but you. Verse 12. 
Then Zerubbabel, don't ever forget that name, he that was born in Babel but came out, out of confusion. What will do that? Getting into the Word of God. The son of Shealtiel asked for of God. And Joshua, being Savior, the son of Josedek, uh, the Yah is righteous. It's good that you remember those because God is always righteous, meaning he always does what is right. The high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed, good word, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. They began to respect and to love him. They began to believe. And do you know what a difference it can make when, you have, when you're dealing and working with a bunch of believers? I'm going to tell you what, uh, an eagle can really soar with believers, but an eagle doesn't do too good with a bunch of turkeys, okay? Well, what did he mean by that? Uh, shallow, milk-toasted, unpotty-trained Christians that are so biblically illiterate they don't know for sure what God's Word is about. And if you think we're not in that time, if you go out and ask, as Gallup did in the past year or so back, how many, from many Christians who preached the Sermon on the Mount. And it was disgusting and embarrassing as to how few people that called themselves Christians knew who preached the Sermon on the Mount. It's disgusting. But they still call themselves Christians. Do I think they are? God doesn't like lazy people, and you know what? I, I, I guess I'm really kin to him because I don't either. If somebody's too lazy to get into the Father's Word to bless their own family, to help their, and guide their own children where they have de a decent life, I don't know what to think about them. I really don't. So th this group begins to obey and all kinds of good things begin to happen. Why don't you try it? Verse 13, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger to the, uh, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. It doesn't take much. As long as you are trying, God will be with you. How do you try? You get into his word. God sent this word to you to get your attention. A letter telling you how to be successful. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jesedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work. Hey, consider, underline it, don't ever forget it. Did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, you, you go to a fluffy duff and he says, all you got to do is believe. Well, it is true that believing will bring you salvation, but don't you want something to go with it? Do you want to be a nobody in heaven? Well, I resent that. Well, go ahead and resent it if you like, but the book of Revelation makes it very clear that there's going to be some people up there that are as naked as a jaybird. I mean, that means they haven't got a pocket to even put something in. They were a nobody here, and they're going to be a nobody there in heaven. Well, I thought it was sweet there. It is. Oh, how sweet it is for one that works, one that is blessed. I don't know how you're doing. Think about it. Verse 15. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Well, this sets a date, and we're going to pick up three weeks later as we start the next chapter. And boy, are you going to see a difference. It's the difference that it makes when you do God's work. His work may be you just studying his word whereby you give yourself a little Christian education to see not what men might say is missing in five but what God says is missing in five, grace, unmerited favor, whereby in loving him and repenting, saying, Father, I missed the mark. Help me. He will. And you'll have peace of mind. Consider. Think about that chapter and think on it long. Don't miss the next one. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. I want you please.